I see a ton of Stellantis branded muscle cars where I live. The Dodge Challenger and Charger practically own this place, which is why I was very excited to get my hands on a different muscle car this week. One that comes from General Motors, but isn't a Camaro. This is the Cadillac CT5V Blackwing manual. Up front we have full LED headlights and these vertical LED DRLs, very typical of modern Cadillacs. But let me know in the comments section if you agree with this or not. Now this is a little bit of a wild take, but every time I see the new CT5, especially from the angle you're looking at it right now, I see those cartoon walking and talking fish from Dr. Seuss. You know, the ones that hop out of the fishbowl and they can walk and talk. For some reason, I don't know if it's the overall shape of the car or these DRLs or both, but that's what I see when I see this car. Let me know if I'm a little crazy for thinking that. Like the CTS sedan that it replaced, the CT5 here is somewhat of a tweener car. On the outside, its dimensions are closer to that of a Mercedes-Benz E-Class, but on the inside, it's closer to a C-Class. So when it comes to the Blackwing here, you should be really comparing these to AMG C63s and BMW M3s. Tail lights back here are also full LEDs. Now this particular model here has both of the carbon fiber packages added onto it. The first one's $4,100 and adds you the carbon fiber rear spoiler we have right here, the front splitter, as well as the wheel well deflectors. The second package is $5,230 and it adds the carbon fiber grill header, the rocker panels, as well as this rear diffuser. Unfortunately, it's really hard to tell you have any of that in this black Raven paint color. I do wish Cadillac had given me a brighter color that pops a little bit more like blaze orange or electric blue, but this all black treatment does give the Blackwing a certain degree of stealth that I do really like. How you can tell a CT5V Blackwing from a regular CT5V or any other CT5 for that matter, the much wider fender flares, the red Brembo brakes that we have on this model right here, these 19 inch satin finished alloy wheels, the staggered width tires, 275 millimeter in the front, 305 in the back, the carbon fiber rear spoiler, and the other carbon fiber bits we have on this particular model. Oh, and that glorious soundtrack. <laughs> Standard safety features on this CT5V Blackwing with a manual transmission include automatic emergency braking, forward collision alert, front pedestrian detection, that safety alert seat which vibrates your butt if you're about to hit something, front and rear parking assist, the teen driver controls which allows you to you know, limit the speed or the distance in which your teenage driver should be taking their Blackwing. I don't suggest you give this to a 16 year old, but you know, that feature's there. Anyway, lane keep assist with lane departure warning, and finally, lane change alert with the blind spot monitor. That's all standard. Optional safety features include, and I am going to bundle in the brakes with this because brakes are a safety feature of every car, but there is a $9,000 carbon ceramic brake package, which would be very interesting to test out because I've only got the red Brembos on here, and for $9,000, those other brakes must be really quite fantastic. Powering the CT5V Blackwing is not the twin turbo V8 that was found in the short-lived CT6V. Instead, we have a carryover but updated version of the supercharged V8 from the old CTS-V. 668 horsepower and 659 pound-feet of torque, which is an increase of 28 and 29 respectively. $3,175 will get you a 10-speed automatic, but this six-speed manual is an exceptional fit for spirited drivers. The best stick shifters out there should be able to squeeze out a 3.6 second 0 to 60 time. The automatic should do 0 to 60 in as low as 3.4 seconds. And we also have Cadillac's magnetic ride control and adaptive dampers to help smoothen out the ride or make it more track focused depending on your needs at the time. Normally with the way this particular Blackwing is spec'd out, we would actually have a foot activated rear trunk lid right here, but because of the extra carbon fiber bits, they actually delete that feature. Nevertheless, we still have 11.9 cubic feet of trunk space to work with back here. That is nowhere near as large as the larger segment options like the 5 Series from BMW. This is going to definitely be more closely in line with the 3 Series or a C-Class. But if you want to fold down the second row seats and expand that storage out, you can. There is a 60-40 split, which you can do from the second row. But if you want even more space and you don't really want to cross over into crossover territory, you're probably going to want to go over to an Audi dealership and check out the RS5 Sport bag. On the left side here, we have the access to the battery, which is very convenient. And then down here, no spare tire, but we do have a fix a flat kit and some first aid type things, and then some storage over on the right side. So front seat comfort is quite exceptional for a hardcore performance sedan with race inspired bucket seats like this. Both sides are actually 18 way power adjustable. The only difference is the driver gets two person memory settings that can be linked to driver profiles in the infotainment system. Now you can adjust the bottom cushion bolsters, the seat back bolsters, you can 
extend the thigh cushioning right here, and there's four-way adjustability to the lumbar support. This is the sky cool gray interior color. If you upgrade to the semi aniline leather, which is a $4,000 upgrade, mind you, this two-tone color scheme actually inverts. So the bolsters become the gray and the inserts become black. This also has GM safety alert seat function, which vibrates your rump when you're about to maybe run into something in a parking lot or there's a potential collision coming up. It's a very unique take on that technology, I must say. <laughs> Rear seat comfort is actually pretty decent. With my five foot nine self sitting in front of me, I still have plenty of knee room, plenty of foot room. I actually think this could be a very nice long road trip spot. And even up top, I've got a decent amount of headroom left. Unfortunately, my tall friend Parker was not available this week to do the tall person tally, so I cannot tell you if it's comfortable for a six foot six person. But if I'm gonna guess based on my height, he probably would not give this a thumbs up. Legroom might be okay though. Right here is the lever to fold down the rear seat. As you can see, the middle belt right there can actually be detached. So when you fold down the 60% section over there, that won't get in the way. Right here, you can also see there is a fold down armrest with two cup holders. This particular model has the suede microfiber interior trim package, which means you get that material here in the center of the door panel, just above the sky cool gray colored leather padded armrest. I will say this is kind of firm. It's not the softest place to put your arm, but we also have some good carbon fiber, some real carbon fiber trim right here. And then up top, this is the kind of leather padding I would like to see down here. This is much softer. Continuing on the inside, that suede microfiber continues onto the headliner right up there, as well as the back of the bucket seats up front. You can actually get these in carbon fiber as well if you want, so keep that in mind. Down below, we have two air vents, as well as a car style jack and a USB port. And finally, the aforementioned armrest right here with two cup holders. As with the rear seat, the door panels up front are a mixture of materials and colors. Down bottom, we have that black hard plastic and a cubby area that's not very large. You probably fit one large bottle in there, maybe a couple of snacks. Then in the middle, we have that sky cool gray colored leather padded armrest, which is again, not super comfortable for your arm. It's kind of hard. Then in the middle there is that microfiber suede material, which looks really good. And then above that, the real carbon fiber trim by the door handle. Over this way, we have the glove box, which is an average size and more carbon fiber trim just above that. And then below on the right, you'll see the speaker grill for the AKG premium audio system, but AKG does not make it very stylistic. It's a very plain cover. Up top here, we have our command center for the OnStar system on this first level. As we creep up, you have door controls as well as the LED lighting for the passenger and the driver right here. And finally, three programmable buttons for the HomeLink system. There is no sunglass holder though, unfortunately. Up front and center is Cadillac's Q infotainment system, which has this sort of tablet style screen popping out on the top. This system is so much better than what it used to be, especially when it first came out. Q, Cadillac user experience, was really laggy, really, really buggy. This one is snappy to respond to your touch. It's very quick to connect to your smartphone. Apple CarPlay and Android Auto are both wireless. They connect in a breeze, no troubles there. The system gets a thumbs up from me. One interesting thing is how they place the volume knob below. As you can see, there's a knob to the right, which you would assume is a tuning knob, but in fact, that is actually a rotary controller, if you will. Instead of having that rotary controller like other brands do down lower on the dashboard, Cadillac puts it right there next to the volume knob. It's only there if you would rather not touch the screen and just use that to navigate around to different functions. But you do have a nice physical home button there in the center, two air vents below, and then a ton of hard buttons for your air conditioning and other functions below, including your parking assist, your lane departure warning, 360 degree surround camera system, as well as your heated and ventilated seats. Moving on down the dashboard, of course, we have our six speed manual transmission shifter right there. Right below that, we have our controls to turn on and off the rev match feature, as well as your traction control. And then this toggle switch allows you to shift between the drive modes. Below that, we have a little cubby to place your key in, and then two cup holders right here. The car isn't 100% devoid of black plastic though, because over here on the door panel around the window switches, we do have a little bit of it going on. All four windows, as you can see, are automatic up and down. Then we've got our mirror controls, and then the memory seat function for the driver over in the top left there. The steering wheel is a leather wrapped affair, very comfortable to hold in the hand, but it's a perfectly round steering wheel, no flat bottom here. On the left side, we've got controls for your cruise control as well as your heated steering wheel function, your voice controls, and hanging up your phone if you have one connected via Bluetooth. Below that is your V button. This button is exciting because when you push it, engine sound, traction control, ride comfort, all of that gets automatically bumped up to the most hardcore setting. So if you wanna quickly turn this thing into a track car, 
press that V button right there. Over on the left side, we have a toggle switch to change your performance traction control down there on the bottom. Above that, we have your forward and back buttons for your audio, as well as some volume controls, and then the button that allows you to adjust what's happening up in your LCD instrument cluster, which I'll get to in a moment. And lastly, we have some more carbon fiber trim down here and the vehicle number. In front of the steering wheel here is a fully digital instrument cluster with a couple of different display themes that you can go through. Tor gives you an actual speedometer in the center. I like the transitions between these different views. As you can see, this is just a little bit simpler, a little bit more, you know, relaxed looking. Sport dials things up and gives you a giant tachometer in the center. And of course, again, I like the way they sort of have it transition like that. That looks really cool. And then track mode switches things up completely and gives you more of a horizontal theme. You can also link these different themes to your drive mode. So for example, you could have the car in track mode, but leave it on the tour theme or vice versa. You could have the car driving around in the tour setting, but have the track theme on the screen. Whatever you want, it's very customizable and it's very crisp with really good graphics and transitions. This is a very well done LCD instrument cluster. With over 600 pound-feet of torque at your fingertips, the CT5V Blackwing is ready to pounce in really any gear. Just give it a nice stab, and there we go. This transmission is a very short throw stick shift right here. The clutch pedal is pretty heavy, so in stop and go traffic, it is a little bit difficult to modulate. The clutch take up happens very early on in the release of the pedal, so you kind of have to finesse it a little bit and figure it out. Um, after a while, you do get used to it. But actually, this transmission kind of prefers the salsa over the tango. I find it a little bit easier to shift when I'm pushing the car harder. Zero to 60 should happen in the manual transmission model in the high three second range, so around 3.6 or seven, depending on how good you are with the clutch pedal. Um, if you get that 10 speed automatic, that drops down to 3.4 seconds, because as we know, the computers are always a little bit faster. So if you really want that more engaged feeling, this is still a very fast car and a very fun car to drive. Not only does it feel that fast on the road, but the soundtrack that accompanies your acceleration is this beautiful crescendo of just insanity. It's a very audible experience and one that you're going to get a little bit addicted to because it does sound and feel very cool. And remember, if you want a V8 with a manual transmission in a four-door sedan, this is really the only game in town now because all the Germans have abandoned the manual transmission, except for the BMW M3, of course, but that is not a V8. Now, on the American side, the Dodge Charger does offer a plethora of V8 choices, but it doesn't come with a manual transmission. This has rev match downshifting as well, so, you know, if you're trying to daily drive this car, it does take the stress out of that element of the manual transmission experience, and is another reason why I think you should consider getting the manual if you really want one. Rev match downshifting really makes this a more livable car. When you do have the rev matched on, the actual gear position you have in the gauge cluster here turns yellow to let you know that that feature is turned on. You will slip and slide around in this thing on a hard acceleration, even with all the traction control turned on, and that makes this just a little bit more entertaining when you are giving it a full throttle acceleration. I'm not able to test 60 to zero braking on the car because I don't have the proper measurement tool for it, but I will say I am curious to know what those optional $9,000 carbon ceramic brakes are like because these Brembos could use a little bit more bite if you ask me. Handling, of course, is super sharp. I mean, you point the steering wheel where you want it to go and that's where you're gonna go. The steering is actually one of the highlights of this experience. It just feels so natural and very direct. It's exactly what you want out of a car like this. And it's not numb, but it's not super heavy either. It's a nice balance between, you know, engaging, but also easy to use, especially if you're living with this car day to day. It's also really good on the highway. If you're, you know, doing long cruises on long straightaways, it's good at, you know, keeping a steady line down the road. Now on the right here, we have a toggle that lets you go through those performance traction control modes. There's five different settings. Uh, there's even a wet mode. So I, I think if you want to you know, drive this around in a sort of recently rained on surface, uh, that traction control mode will help you out there. Otherwise on this tail of the dragon, the combination of the really good Pirelli tires and those traction control systems have left me feeling very confident behind the wheel of these very sharp turns and hairpins and all those things like that that make this such a fun driving road. I have to say there isn't really much of a noticeable difference in how the car feels behind the wheel from tour and sport or track. It's really down to the sound of the engine. You can really hear more of that pop and burble and you know the really fun noises you get out of the 6.2 liter supercharged V8 engine. This is a very comfortable car in all situations. Driving on the highway to get up here to the mountains, I found it to be so comfortable and smooth. It's like a tank. It just rolls down the highway with a lot of authority. It's very solid and it holds a line very easily. And then when you get to the twisties like this, it really lets loose and becomes the performance sedan it's meant to be. 
everything about it is raw, visceral, and fun. And compared to those Germans, I think there's a little bit more drama to it because of the manual transmission, because of that rear-wheel drive character. All of the above make this a very unique choice when it comes to four-door sedans with this amount of power. We do have that fourth generation magnetic ride control with adaptive dampers on here. And like I said, when you change between the different drive modes, I have to say I don't really see or feel much of a difference. This car never gets that serious. It never gets that hardcore. It never beats you up. This is still a luxury car at the end of the day. And it does a very good job at playing both parts. When it comes to the cabin noise, this is not a super quiet car. I was getting around 79 decibels on average when measuring it at 50 miles per hour. But it's actually quite muted considering what we have under the hood. I know you don't care about the fuel economy of this car and neither should a buyer of something like this, but around town driving, I was getting less than 10 miles per gallon. But on the highway getting here, I was getting about 21 miles per gallon. If you're like me and you like to drive cars that make you stand out from the crowd, this is definitely going to be the one. Maybe not specifically in this all black exterior color choice. The fact that it even exists in 2022 is a testament to General Motors' commitment to giving customers a lot of choices in a lot of different segments and giving them an option that's amazingly fun behind the wheel. So I really commend them for keeping this car around and I hope the next generation of more electrified vehicles like this is anywhere even close to as fun as this is. When the majority of high performance four door sports sedans come from Germany, why not get the one that comes from right here in the United States? The Cadillac CT5V Blackwing is an incredible sports sedan. It looks the part and it drives just as well, if not better than those German counterparts. And it's one of only two available in the United States with a manual transmission. Now, if you can row your own gears and you want something in this segment, I say go for the manual because it is incredibly fun to drive and it's easy to shift even for the 668 horsepower you have under the hood. In my opinion, it's the pick I would go with for four door sports sedans in the segment. And it's the one that's gonna help you stand out in the crowd, even if you get it in the all black like I got it. Thanks so much for tuning in for the video. We really appreciate your view. Make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, as well as the Alex on Autos website for the written reviews, Auto Buyer's Guide podcast, and the EV Buyer's Guide channel. Until next time, take care.